Three, two, one. How to ski it. Almost. Episode 13. Lucky number 13. Lucky number 13. How to Ski It podcast, the podcast for skiers, by skiers, about skiers, to skiers, from skiers. And, man, if we we're going to dig in on anything, it's the defection that we had. <laughs> yeah, what happened there? So we'll talk about the ski train that we all took on Friday, which was just a couple days ago. But before we talk about the ski train, we get there. And our bro Dylan shows up without skis, but with a snowboard. With my snowboard. That's right. I am not ashamed. <laughs> I, uh, you know, <clears throat> we've talked about this with bikes and I'm starting to come to a conclusion that I feel the same that I do with bikes, which is. Let me stop you there. All bikes have two wheels. A snowboard has one plank. That's fine. I'm just saying. That's fine. Not, you can't I just like two. being on the snow. But I'm, I just like I'm being on the snow. With you there. I'm just saying don't compare them to bikes. Well, okay, so I like mountain biking, I like gravel biking, I like road biking, I like being on two wheels. If I'm on the snow, I'm I'm having a good time. It's called a ski train, Dylan. <laughs> ski train. <laughs> it, I am enjoying both sports very much. And we were going to Winter Park, which is, Mary Jane is kind of my old stomping grounds. And <clears throat> I really wanted to enjoy the terrain and enjoy the good conditions in a way that I haven't yet this year because I've been focusing on learning a new skill, which that in itself is a blast. So it's definitely a big goal of mine to uh, bring my ski level up similar to snowboarding so that I can think more about the mountain on skis and less about are my tips together and where my poles and that stuff I wanted to break from. So it's, it's definitely... Fu it's funny because I feel like most of the day we were saying, where's Dylan? Yeah, I'm uh, slow on the flat stuff because I don't have poles and I really need some attention on my snowboard and excuses, excuses. So I had to unstrap a lot. Dude, I got a lot of excuses this week as well. I don't know <laughs> if Dylan was as slow as like we crisscrossed the mountain. We were like, let's go from the northernmost point to the southernmost point. You were setting me up. We did. And it wasn't <laughs> intentional, but it was that one time there was nobody in lift line. It was a busy day on Friday. For a Friday, it was a Saturday at Winter Park. Uh, Friday's the new Saturday. And we got in line because Dylan was right behind us, and we had to get out of line. We were those people. <laughs> and then there was a lift line. <laughs> and so... Um, and it was like, we, we got in there, and we're like, he was right behind me. I know he was right behind me. And then like 30 minutes later... He comes like scooting comes up one boot in. And trudging up the mountain. Right behind us at the top of the Galloping Goose is 10 minutes later at the bottom. But I will just say this, because Dylan, you did just say this, and I, I, I applaud this. Oh, he's saying I want to do both, and I, I wish I could do both. I, I, I could go on all day on the times I've tried snowboarding, and I had friends that were professional snowboarders that gave me snowboards and boots and said, it's time for you to be a snowboarder. And I went out and gave it a legitimate try and just was a quitter. I mean, that's all there is to it. I just flat out bust into tears, pounded my hands on the snow and quit. <laughs> Where? And I can attribute that that is true. The crying, true. It, yeah, I just, I couldn't do it. And I and I do skateboard uh, regularly and I'm a good wakeboarder. I don't know why I can't snowboard or cross country ski. <laughs> <laughs> I've always thought that snowboarding was a lot harder than skiing to start and just be able to stand up and connect a turn but then once you're there, you're there and you're just off to the races. So but, I get but that. Dylan is a great boarder. So my comment about waiting for Dylan was only about the flats. Dylan, he is fast and on it. He was way ahead of me on all of the uh, actual runs. It was just it was just the flats where I was ahead of him. <laughs> and we're just giving him a hard time. We, we respect the snowboarders that respect us. And Dylan is a good snowboarder. And he's fun to ride with. Yeah, he's a good snowboarder because we skied... We had a fairly advanced day. I don't. I wouldn't call anything we skied like double diamonds or anything like that. Definitely not EX. Don't get me started on the EX. That I feel like they're just making everything EX these days. And it used to just be called a black diamond. And then it was called a double black diamond. And that meant don't mess with this if you are not an advanced accomplished skier and you can self-arrest. 
And now they've thrown this EX on it. And I don't know what any of that means, but that's for another, that's for another day. That's I'll a whole t- episode. I'll tell you the five or six runs in Colorado that are EX on a later episode. Um, may I recommend we do a rewind and go back to the beginning of our day? Yeah. So we, let's go back to the beginning of a couple days before. So yeah. we, we bought tickets for the ski train and uh, we bought them in whatever day they went for sale. I think it was December. December. And they announced the ski train. And this goes from downtown Denver to Winter Park and back to downtown Denver. And when I'd heard about it, it's been around my whole life. It used to stop off Highway 93 near Boulder. And growing up, I rode trains a lot to visit my grandparents in Grand Junction. But the day or two before the ski train, I was like, I'm really going to burn one of my days off and have to get up at 5 a.m. and drive to downtown Denver and ride a train and get home at like 6 p.m., which we got home at 8 p.m., and so I would, if I hadn't, and I spent a hundred bucks, I, I bought refundable tickets. So they're $55 each way. So that's one ten actually. And I was a little bit disappointed in the decision. I mean, we have dogs, we had to come drop them off at the studio. The staff had to watch the dogs, but the minute we parked the car in the union station parking garage, it was cool. It was something and magic, magic. And just like, Yeah. We got our skis. We got a boot bag. We packed light. And in this case, we probably didn't need to. We could have brought another bag or something. There was plenty of room and luggage storage on the train. But Marcus, take it away. Like we, so we rode up the elevator and then voila, you're. Yeah. You walk out onto the platform in, in Union Station and greeted by the massive sign. It's awesome. And the train is right there. Ton of volunteers, which is crazy but the the ski train has volunteers that help out they're standing on the platform hey they see people with skis walking the wrong way and they shout it out hey ski trains over here got us in there got us seated which we got there at 6 30 and train departed at 7 so we were on we were on board at like 6 15 thinking that we had to be on board by 6 30 um which turns out you didn't have to be on board they just kind of recommend you get there early but but it was cool. It was awesome because you're in these super. It's not like flying. You're in these. Oh yeah. You're in like recliner chairs, and so being there a little bit early, and being on the train and being worried about every single person walking down the aisle is going to sit next to you was awesome. Yeah, and they had a lounge car. It it didn't have like full breakfast or anything, but it had some like pastries that you could get. It had beer, mimosas, bloody marys, uh, screwdrivers, and. No sodas. And the hottest <laughs> coffee you could possibly and drink. Insanely hot coffee. It was awesome. And then like little snacks like uh, bags of chips and candy bars and stuff. It was awesome. And the, so recommendation, pro tip, our pro tip to you is if you are going to do the train with more than two people, you want to get there early because you can get seats that face each other and they're in little four pack squares. So if you get there early, you can get those or if you get there really early and there's a limited number, you can go in the viewing car, which is spectacular. Overall, I felt like looking into doing the, the train, there was very little information online for what to expect. And I spent probably a half hour scouring Reddit for, like forums from, you know, 10 years ago because the ski train took a break and wasn't operating for a few years. And so it's a lot of outdated information. And, uh, I, I know that there's a, a few tips that I think that we can come up with that are just like, Hey, here's what to expect. The biggest one for me, the takeaway was the train does not really operate during the day. It's sole purpose is to pick people up from union station and take them to winter park. And then it basically sits. And the, what, what that means is if you have a return ticket home, your seat up to the mountain is the same seat coming back down. And so that was huge. You know, we were, I, I, I was like, Hey, if I bring a bag, like, do I need to get a locker? Do I need to wear my ski boots? Like, how am I going to do this? And, and once I realized that I could leave my stuff at my seat, then it like, that's huge. That's huge. And they're not really picky. If, if you look at the fine print, I think you get, it's like an airplane. You get like two check bags and two personal items, which is more than anyone really needs. But my understandings are not really picky. You just 
if you're just there to ski and they're all volunteers that are also there to ski. So it's funny. Cause I was like, okay, so we'll get a $25 locker and then that locker we can fit, you know, all of our stuff in because it says it can hold like four skis. And I was like, over-engineered the whole thing. I under-engineered food though. Definitely. Yeah, I would snacks. bring. Yeah. Cause there's like an airplane, there was over the head storage and then behind the seats, there's additional storage. So your bag can go in one place, your personal stuff or your food can go. So definitely you can make yourself comfortable for the day with real food and snacks and stuff. And I, I want to give a big shout out to the volunteers. Like I was so impressed with not only the, what I believe were employees, the Amtrak employees, cause yeah. they're like the engineer and stuff. And they did the whole, you know, all aboard and all the cool stuff, but the volunteers from Colorail and it's C O L O R A I L.org, Colorail.org were amazing. Like the guy that did the awesome. PA in the train and said, here's what we're looking at. It wasn't too much, but it was hilarious. And he had a somewhat aggressive sense of humor like hey i want to awesome. thank jane for coming up and yelling at me interrupting me during my announcements and then we saw the guy because you could tell it was the same guy and we said are you going to ski today and he said yeah of course i'm going to ski and so they volunteer make sure we have a pleasant ride up there make sure we get off the train they get all our skis out of the ski storage and then they get their skis out and go ski and then come back and load us back up I, you know, we work in endurance sports that are run by volunteers and we couldn't put on these marathons and triathlons without volunteers, but the ski train wouldn't work without the volunteers either. So huge, huge. Thank you. Above and beyond volunteers. And they made an announcement that call rail are advocates for rail across Colorado. So they want more ski trains. They want cars off I-70. They want trucks off I-70. They advocate and lobby with our civic leaders for rail. Do you know why there's no rail service on I-70? Because our civic leaders haven't had to take any action for 50 years, so there's no reason to take action now. Yeah. That's why. So think about that when you vote, and think about giving to call a rail, because they're pushing to have ski trains all the time, and they're pushing to have ski trains go up I-70 and things like that. And yes, the ski train is a lot of work if you're from Boulder, but holy smokes, if you're from Denver or downtown Denver, Dude, what are you doing? Oh my gosh, would that be convenient? I've considered moving and changing my life to be a volunteer on the ski train. I'll yeah, be honest. Me too. To a flat on 16th Street Mall. <laughs> yep. <laughs> That's exactly right. But, but can you imagine if they had, I don't know, three, four trains daily? Would like, be like, incredible, and, and they weren't a hundred bucks; they were twenty round trip, and it was a. But now you have so many more people, even if it's just Winter Park. Or can you imagine if they actually built the rail on thirty six? And yeah, you take, the one we voted for. Yeah, and paid your tax money for. Can you imagine if that Thanks, actually C. happened? Dot. Yeah, and then we could take that down to Union Station. I believe that was the Regional Transportation District that Thanks, let us regional down. Regional RTD. <laughs> <laughs> um, but. Ooh. But, and again, we've harped on I-70. It is a legitimate solution, and they took that very light moment to help educate us that this is a potential solution. Would it solve the problem? No. Would adding some things together like this start to solve the problem? Absolutely. Yeah. It would help. It'd be... Anything tremendous. would help at this point. So we got to Winter Park, and we waited in like a 10-minute gondola line. Uh, anyway, getting off the train is like 100 yards to the gondola. Yeah. Like that. It's right there. I couldn't believe. It's 100 meters from where you get off the train to where you get on the gondola. We rode up the gondola, which hey, takes real quick, you how nowhere. How was the train? Was it two hours? Yeah, approximately okay, two that's hours. that's what I was thinking. About two yeah, hours. Yeah, we got there at right. nine. It was scheduled for two, and I think it was like an airplane where we didn't have any hang like hiccups. So I think we got there in like an hour forty, and then the way home, I think we did have some hiccups. It actually took like the full two hours, but yeah, we stopped twice on the way home because I guess rail crossings weren't working. And my understanding from what they said is, you know, staff gets off the train and makes sure the cars stop, and then gets back on the train is what I thought he said. That's what I heard as and well. That's nuts. That's bonkers, but awesome. It worked out. It was a quick stop. Yeah. And I mean, it was, it was, sorry, before we get, get to Winter Park, the, just very quickly, the visuals on the train 
wow just awesome if you sit on <laughs> sit on the, the north side the right north side. side thank you it's it's the right side as you're heading out well i guess it depends on which direction you're facing the north side of the train do not sit on the south side of the train you get one thing that you get to boast about and then your friends on the north the side make fun we of got you. to see two moose those of us that sat on that side Mooses. so the train does park at union station it essentially backs into it because it's only like one way entrance uh on the platform so <clears throat> it looks very symmetrical and you don't know much about trains it would be hard to tell but it, it takes off heading east first so you're actually going to board on the south side of the train as it's parked at union station because then it turns around and goes west it's the if uh the i would call it starboard side of the traveling direction of the train passenger side <laughs> You'll never figure it out unless you're on the train and the dude tells you. I'm, I'm going to add one more thing for directionally challenged people. Sit on the side where you can see the Union Station uh, neon sign above the, Union The baseball Station. stadium side. That's what you want. Union Station, the sign. <laughs> the lounge car was also facing the right way. Yeah, and I would just ask the volunteer, like I've been totally. able to sit on the north side of the train going up. And they're going to say this side because oh, I went, oh, wait, I sat don't backwards. even say the north side. In fact, I would just say, which is the scenic side? Yeah, they'll know because one side you look at a hillside and the other side you can see, you know, you can see Long's Peak and you can see Gross Reservoir and you go through Rollinsville and then the Moffat Tunnel, which is like a 10 minute. Can we talk about the tunnels? Because how many are there? We don't know. <laughs> we There's don't know. no way to know. No, you'll never know. We were told the day before we went that there was going to be 28, and then the train PA announcer said there was 27, but who knows? But then there was T31. Yeah, they're labeled. because but, and, and, and there used to be older ones. They've gotten rid of some, so that could be an old labeling from back in the day, but... Um, I don't know. They're cool, though, nonetheless. Like 26 to 31. I would love people to chime in. Yeah. But all in all, amazing. But it's just a train ride. We did go to go skiing. Sorry. Yep. Gondola. That goes to nowhere. Well, that's not true. <laughs> it got us teed up to get to Mary Jane. Yep. But And then we skied um, a tree run to get to Mary Jane, which was... Whoa. What What run was that? Does anybody know? I can't remember. I've never skied it because I've never been to really that part of Winter Park. I did figure it out. It's basically there's a black run that there's like a connector run from the gondola to the bottom of Mary Jane, essentially. And I, I can't remember what that's Drunken called. Frenchman? Almost. the I think it's Sober, Sober Frenchman, which is the blue connector. Off of that, you can come down a black called Outhouse or Drunken Frenchman. Outhouse is what I was thinking of, actually. And we went down the trees between Outhouse and, and Drunken Frenchman, and then we we spat out basically at the bottom of Drunken Frenchman. And, man, I wish we skied that more. We're going to yeah. call that Quad Fire Ridge. <laughs> yeah, like as I've gotten older, starting on a, a bumped-out tree run was difficult. But the snow conditions were as good as... As they get. There wasn't a lot of fresh powder, maybe an inch or two. It looked like it snowed three or four inches the day before and five inches the night before, not the night before we skied, the night before, the day before. Yeah. And incredible. Dude, Quadfire Ridge was, uh, first off, great name. Second off, <laughs> that was the first run of the day. We started, bumped out tree run, full send yeah <laughs> it was which was oh, rough it was a uh you know it was a proclamation for how we were going to take that entire day of skiing yeah, got... when you say that man i took the fuzzy bunny run around on the side as a non-warm-up warm-up run and that uh also set the tone for my day yeah two things happened to me on that run one i said i cannot sustain this pace until four o'clock this afternoon when the train leaves and two how did dave just walk out of his ski like that <laughs> yeah i was gonna say dave had something happen it was, it, was, it was unlike any you know yard sale i've ever seen he the one ski literally just he made a turn and it stopped yeah the and, ski stayed he kept going but it was like it was the weirdest i'm, I'm watching thinking, slow motion it was weird i'm thinking i wasn't like locked yeah. in i'm thinking like sometimes when you're all hyped up and we're all hyped up to get skiing and we we're coming in from a new way. So it was basically like a new place for me. And I must not have, which is bad business. <laughs> I must not have clipped in all the way properly. Cause I did 
lose it on like the second turn of the day, um, which zapped a little bit of my confidence. But let's keep going because it was a special day. We went um, down to the Super Gauge, which is the six pack at Mary Jane, rode the Super Gauge up to the tip top, and then we skied the upper part of Trestle Trees and went down to the Panorama Lift. And that's how you get to Eagle Wind. And we've talked about Eagle Wind before. And w- Eagle Wind was spectacular. I mean, Eagle Wind is some of the best skiing in Colorado. And the only thing that took away from it is it was mobbed. And it's mobbed. never mobbed. It was mobbed. That's the first time I've ever skied Eagle Wind. That's the first time I've ever skied anything honestly like that but obviously i've skied a, f- a few trees this year this is the first year i've ever skied trees the eagle wind lift was a a hundred percent the first run which i can't remember the name of it off that side little raven is on the other side but that that first side thunderbird um on the the thunderbird run was my skiers run right. of the year skiers right thank you that was my run of the year for sure so it was, far, it, it was, was amazing. It was it was incredible. But one of the big things about Eagle Wind used to be that you were there by yourself. And on the runs, we were by ourselves. But because of, and we, we haven't really been able to get a straight answer because the rumor is they added safety bars to the chairs and that changed the weight distribution. So now they only load every other chair I struggle a little bit with that because the safety bar maybe weighs 50, 60 pounds. It's not one that you put your feet on. It's just a bar and every other chair. So you're, you're docking like 500 pounds a chair because of a hundred pound addition, but I guess times two chairs. So they load every other chair. So the line was, and again, this is where this is six or seven minutes. You know, it wasn't outrageous. Yeah. It looked way worse than it was, but for Eagle wind six or seven minutes, I was making the point, it's only the second time I've ever seen people at the Eagle Win lift, much less a six or, six or seven minute lift line. I, I will say this as someone who this is the first experience with the Eagle Wind lift, skiing back there was worth every minute of yep. that seven minute wait. Yeah. Every, every bit of it, it was worth it. And after, you know, top to bottom on any Eagle Wind standing up and relaxing for four or five minutes isn't the worst thing in the world. And that's what's great about the fixed grip is you kind of get a chance to sit down, catch your breath, cool off, and then do it again. It's a three-man fixed grip that is uncomfortable. Like it's a, it's a yan. It's an old yan lift, but it digs into your back. There's no cushion, and it's worth every bit. So we did Thunderbird, and then our plan was to make, if you haven't seen it, go to our YouTube channel, we make these little shorts, like here's a great run. So our plan was to do Little Raven, and we skied that twice. And to me, that was the run of the year, that it was soft, big, treed moguls, and they were soft enough that you could just treetop them. And that's where you just kind of skip across the tops of them, um, which was amazing. It's one of those areas where you start on one run, and you just kind of follow the snow like we did when we were trying to do Little Raven. And next thing you know, you're three, four runs over, but you just go with the flow. It's soft. It's protected. It's in the trees. There's no wind. There's, you know, the sun doesn't bake it. It's just, it's, a- it's got everything. It's, excellent. Excellent. Yeah. And there was a lot of snow. I mean, like it was, it was, uh, there, there were fresh turns to be had. And no rocks. I and mean, no it was rocks. complete coverage. It was the best you could ask for. And what was the saying they had on the Eagle wind sign? Like backcountry oh, skiing? It's, um, out of bounds skiing in bounds. It you know, except for the fact that it's been skied. Right. Which to me is where out of bounds skiing is different and but dangerous. And this isn't. Um yeah, it, it kind of is a it cool does feel that way. It, it says the thrill of being out of bounds oh. without being out of bounds. Thank you. Yeah, and it's it's awesome. Like I grew up skiing Mary Jane and not a lot over at Winter Park and Eagle Wind to me makes Winter Park just in a fantastic ski area because of this whole mountain of advanced skiing. And I like steep trees and we're talking 35 degrees, maybe more in a few places and trees and 1800 vertical feet. So longer than a lot of the other tree runs that we ski. Like if you can get more than a thousand feet in a tree run, you're doing something right. Yeah. 
It was awesome. And like Mel said, I had every single run that we did. So Thunderbird and then two little Ravens, every single one, I found spots that no one had skied on yet and skied through (laughs) ankle shin deep powder. One time got stuck in powder. It was so deep. I was like, Oh no, it was, it was awesome. Well, and the moguls were literally the size of Volkswagens. So that's also something to be aware of. I, I like that myself. And so that's where the whole idea of tree topping comes, where you ski on the tops of the moguls and don't get down in those giant ruts. And it's also steep enough to make that easy. And then let's keep going. Eagle wind. We could have went home at that point and had a great wait, day. Wait, before we leave Eagle wind, I want to say that people need to be nicer to lift ops. Like we met one of the Jerry, super, Jerry, one of the supervisors. He had to stand there at the base of the lift as people were loading on and had a little stick to tell people when they could go because they were loading every other chair. And the reason that he was there was because people were being mean to the lifties uh, and, and complaining to them about having to wait a chair. And I just, you know, you guys were out there for fun. Those guys, it's their job. And I can promise you that they aren't the decision makers. So don't be mean to the lift ops. Yeah. And I think Agreed. you should quit skiing. If you're going to yell at the lift ops, you might as well just quit skiing, but, and I'm not defending the jerks, man, is it hard to stand on the your next line and watch a chair go by with a lift line of people waiting behind you. That's Pavlov's. It, uh, you're, you're Pavlov's dog. You're you you can't you it, can't do the it. The first time we we talked to Jerry and he was telling us these stories about how he had to take some passes and yeah you got to wait for another chair got to wait for another chair and then when it was our turn I think you and me both almost went went and we were like ah sorry that that's just, what the <laughs> stick was for and we had a great yeah, conversation job, with him. Um, because the lift was stopped for a minute and yeah, uh, I I feel like this is kind of common and I think the skiers do this on purpose. They hire awesome people. Yeah. He was such a nice guy. And then the girl that, you know, was actually at the lift that was like, you guys are up. Yeah. It just, it was, it makes this cool vibe and kudos to winter park. hundred percent. And then we'll keep talking about winter park. We went back over to Mary Jane and we went to lunch at somewhere I've always liked, but my wife doesn't like, and we had to drag her there, which is, is it the caboose? Club car. The club car, same thing. <laughs> <laughs> you got trained on the mine. And did we not have like oh the best service? Like they, and, and they do this on purpose. They want you to eat, drink, and get out of there. Yeah. And when we're skiing, I want to eat, drink, and get, and get out. out of there. And we had amazing food. So I'll, it wasn't the burger of the year, but yeah. it was excellent. Dude, I had chili. Chili of the year. It was awesome. The tater tots. Tater tots Okay, of the that's year. what I was going to say. I thought the hamburger itself was mediocre. I mean, it wasn't bad. It just wasn't great. But the tater tots were off the off the chart. And the service was great. And, the cl- and it was a busy day. Yeah. And we got seated right away. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this about the club car. It's the best lunch spot, second best lunch spot I've stopped at this year. The one in Telluride, Garano's, was the best lunch spot I've stopped at this year. But the club car in Winter Park was the second best and one of the best lunch spots all around. Next time we go back there, we need to make a video on the club car. We were we were so busy on train we were, stuff. We were and busy skiing. Jamming. <laughs> jamming that day but i would like to say really quick that it's not that i don't the club car has great service but i am having some dietary restrictions and they don't have a lot of options so that was kind of my complaint i and i feel like that's the kind of place that maybe not complaining that day but i'm sure there's like a place you can go and not complain but be like this would be great the how well that place is run i would assume they would take that seriously yeah. Well, and I feel like the manager, um, every time we've been there, he kind of goes around the tables and just always has an eye to make sure that everything is going well for all the guests. And you can tell that he really takes ownership of that place and his staff, the way that they treat you is reflected in that. The way that you they treat you is reflected. Yeah. And, and so the run we took down to Club Car, was that long haul, short haul? No. So I was going to talk about that next. Okay. We, then we went and rode the super gauge up and we went and skied the long haul, short haul trees, which was, uh, we've awesome. done a feature on that. 
we would we would tell you any day it's one of the best tree runs around and i don't know why it is kind of convoluted it's right there but it is kind of convoluted to know where to go and there was fresh tracks in there at 2 p.m yeah on a day that was mobbed and it hadn't snowed significantly yeah there was eight inches of snow in places back there and i thought that was the run of the day and if you ever ask me if you're an advanced skier what's the best run at winter park mary jane i'd say long haul short haul trees myself and it sure delivered yeah and then we went back to close out on trestle which was great but it was mobbed it was that was the weirdest thing ever that was one of the most mob runs ever and it was trestle and it was fully moguled out and we stopped i stopped multiple times to try to let people pass and there's more people behind and then i tried to get in front of people and there's more people in front it was wild i and my philosophy if you want to know one of my theories or philosophies on skiing which i'm sure everybody listening is (laughs) when you get in a crowded thing don't stop or wait for them to ski on push through like pick up the pace and push through, be polite, give, give people room. I tried to push through and I had like six year old kids that were skiing the bumps as good as I am on either side after like a solid, like 95 seconds of pushing the moguls. So then I stopped and that's when I looked back and there was 400 more people coming. And so then, um, overall trestles a single black diamond, but it has one little, technical section in the middle and that did seem to slow people up and we did push through but yeah once we got past that we, we pretty much had the bottom of trestle to ourselves it's the most crowded i've seen an advanced run in my life by far the people were skiing really well too it wasn't like a bunch of for the, the majority of people no, were skiing really was well, skiing yeah. well. it was that was the hardest i've ever gone because with the push through you you started to push through and i was like you know what i'm right behind him it was right when you're talking about those little kids we're like okay we're gonna push through here and i was fully tree topping all these bumps right behind you just dug in and we bombed down through here and and stopped i stopped right behind you after like like you said a minute and a half of just bump 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 we stop and yeah just everyone was still right there and for the first time i've ever seen it there's a advanced section or a a difficult section it's like a little creek bed that is like almost like a waterfall i've never seen it without lots of rocks and i went in there and you kind of just have to turn them point them straight and just kind of send it to get through there there were no rocks it was winter park has the best snow coverage and the best conditions i've ever seen in my lifetime and i've been skiing winter park since i was a little kid so i've been skiing winter park since the 70s and 80s and it's the best coverage best conditions i didn't really find any bad snow on friday at winter park they currently have uh the same base amount as steamboat so that goes to say how much they're getting pummeled this season it was great which is more than most most mountains on the front range. I would be. I wouldn't say Winter Park's my A ski area, but I'd be happy to call Winter Park Mary Jane my my A ski area. It's the total package. The only negative is if you're an intermediate skier, do not go to Mary Jane because there's like two intermediate runs, and we were talking about it. Tell your ride how you can ski double black diamonds, and your friends can take blue squares, and you can meet at the same chairlift. At Mary Jane, it's not the case. They can take one of two blue squares and get there. But they're also going to get bored with those blue squares and start skiing moguls. So, you know, in that sense. But Mary Jane is the most unique ski area, I think, in America because it's 45 bump runs. <laughs> and really, and every really one of them is bumps. great. A great bumps. I My favorite way to ski Mary Jane, to be honest, is I usually would get on – challenger first thing go down sleeper and sleepy hollow as like a as like a warm-up uh for the day um and just work my way skiers right and just like hit everyone all the way and then by the time you get to trestle you're toast and that's my favorite way and you, you enjoy every run that's a great way to do it too so big kudos and then we went back over to winter park which was 
to say that was like a foreign experience to me <laughs> at the end of the day, not to ski to my car, but to go ride the super gauge. And we ended up doing a good run. I think yeah. we hit like Golden Spike or Derailer and then traversing over. And then we skied all the way down to the super gauge. And then there's like a, man, like a over a half mile, like catwalk that gets you back to Winter Park. And it, it worked out. I'm glad we did Golden Spike. Yeah. Because that's a classic, all American classic bump run at Mary Jane. But then we went to. What was the name of that? Derailer. Yeah, thank you. It was derailer. Okay, I could, yeah. Oh, then we went to, okay, sorry. Because we skied Bold, Golden Spike or maybe Rifle Sight Notch. I don't know. One of their classic. Quadfire Ridge. Quadfire Alley. <laughs> but then we went to the bar called the Derailer yeah. and had another amazing experience. And I don't recommend you try this because it's illegal in 49 states. <laughs> but you are riding a train. But we were about to get on the train, so we wanted to have a couple drinks. And so... And we had 30 minutes and the train conductor and the wonderful volunteers at Color Rail said, if you're not here on time, you're not coming home. We don't wait for people. We will leave you. Like an airplane. Same with departing. Yep. So on the way to Winter Park. There's no wiggle room. We'll leave you behind. Yep. So we wanted to get two rounds of beers in a standing room only bar and, and our waiter came over. I wish I could remember his name. Chad. 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 Came over and Chad we said- Brad. No, it was Chad. Chad. Yeah. Can we order a round of IPAs and then have you, you know, go get us another round and we want to pay right then? And he didn't flinch. No, not at all. And showed up. Here's the drinks. And let me grab your check. Here's your check. And, and talking about the legality, we had finished our beer before the second beers had showed up, but we had just ordered the second round when he delivered the first round just to be like, hey, we're in a rush. And he was like, cool. And more time, you're just putting them on the spot with the bartender where they're like, I need four IPAs plus four IPAs. And that puts them on the spot. But we took care of Chad and gave him a nice tip. So if you're ever going to pull that kind of monkey business, yeah, make sure make it worth it. Make it worth it. Because I bet if we went back and Chad was like, he was a bro bra. He was like, yeah, man, how was your day today? Did you guys shred? Or he said something like that. And he's like, I shredded yesterday. Yeah. And I liked that. I do too. skiing. Like you can bro bra out if you're talking about skiing, in my opinion. Well, it's so cool that everyone, well, it feels like everyone you interact with, uh, lifties, management, bartenders, wait, waiters, waitresses, everybody is like, oh yeah, I skied too. It's so great. Oh, the conditions were awesome two days ago. Are they still good? And you're like, yeah, yeah, these are my people. So do you think that waiter and waitress, do you still say waitress or do we just call everyone a waiter now? Wait staff. Wait uh, staff. I, I didn't use the word waitress to be clear. No, no. You did. Maybe. I said wait. I said waiter and <laughs> no, waitress. You, no, it was Marcus. I might have been. I we just was more wondering. <laughs> we, yeah. I, I, don't, I don't know. Is there a, is there a neutral term? Wait staff. I mean, other than wait staff, is there a neutral term? I don't know. That's Whatever their name tag says. I can yeah. tell you what Chad. They, I can tell you what they want. Tips. Is you to treat them with respect and Agreed. give them a decent tip. So yeah. like hundred percent. You, if you're doing that, I'm guessing they're going to let you call them a lot of things. If you're taking, yeah, if you're good. being respectful and yeah, yeah. I, I agree. So kudos to everyone. Yeah. At Winter Park and Mary Jane, I'm going to say customer service really stuck out to me this year at Vail. And it really stuck out to me at Winter Park um, that people and other ski areas should learn from this. They made me feel welcome. The train started it. Yeah. But they made me feel welcome all day. Agreed. Uh, and I'll say about the train, last thing about the train is. Oh, the train ride home. Well, We're not over with the train okay. ride. Getting, not last thing. <laughs> last thing. Getting to Winter Park, you know, you're going into something you've never done before. And, you know, you're. You, there's a little bit of anxiety there, anxious. I don't know. What am I going to do with my skis? How do I get on? Do, how do I scan my ticket? At no point in time did I feel like I was stupid. You know, sometimes you can be in an airport and someone's talking down to you like, how do you not know this? Do you not travel enough? Like, whatever. It was never that way on the train. It was like, do you have any questions before you get on the train? You're like, kind of. Have you seen my buddies? They're wearing, you know, all black and a goofy hat. And they're like, oh, yeah, they're in the back of the train. Yeah. Like the whole the whole customer experience volunteer thing, they were just like, they were just ski guys, ski girls. And then the train ride home was as good as the train ride there, except the sun was setting, not rising. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, that made for some amazing views, though, with sunset happening over uh, the Continental Divide was just 
Wow. And then we were still like, I thought the train would have flipped a UE or something. <laughs> yeah. But the north side is, that's why I say the north side and not 100%. like the left side or the right side. And you have the same seat the way back as you did the way there. You leave stuff on your seat to claim it. So that's why we're saying get the north side. And we saw new stuff and it was awesome. And it is as good as the ride there. They serve booze on the way there that saw, felt weird to me because I got to ski all day, so I can't booze at 7 a.m. Yeah. So I didn't drink on the way there, but a lot of people were. Yes. A lot. And they didn't seem to be discouraging it because they were like, we're serving booze. Yeah. But on the way home, they didn't have an amazing beer selection, but plenty good. I can't remember what I had. They had Dale, Dale's. We had Dale's Pale Ale. Which I love. Mm -hmm. They also had Stella, Coors Light, and what was the other... Uh, Blue Moon. And mimosas and things like that. Well, they had, uh, yeah, they still had the same uh, other alcohol choice on the way back. Um, I'll tell you mimosa, what, though, on the way there, we would knock the cobwebs off if you're feeling a little rough around the edges. A little Bloody Mary on the way up. Yeah. That, Unless not, you're skiing all day. Uh, I'm just saying, if you're hungover. Well, it is a two-hour ride, so if yeah. you start when you get started. And you take a nap and, and wake it, up, you're a new guy. I'd like to point out, it was not bad price. I was kind of expecting like airplane prices or or something. I got, uh, like for example, on the way up, I got a coffee and a nice big, uh, I don't even know the pastry thing I got, streusel. Coffee cake. Coffee cake. It was like the biggest thing they have. Both of those things together was like eight bucks. Man, that's, that's like normal prices. So, and uh, you know, the beer was the same. So get you some. Um, I will say that the last like, 30 minutes of the train ride what felt like it was like five hours. <laughs> I was ready to get off the yeah. train. Well, as, that, as Dave mentioned, that was when we had to stop a couple times for um, some checks and, and for some railroad crossings. That's not typical, but yeah, it, it did last a long time. It also goes back to the day we had, right? I think we did nine runs and 11,000 feet. At, not much, at, but a hard but day. at Mary Jane, it was all moguls. It was all steep. It was all trees. There was no blues. There was no greens. It was, it was know. a great day. Kudos to the ski chain. Kudos to Collar Rail. Like, I, I don't have anything negative to say. And it was, and we usually don't, to be clear, but it was awesome. And if you get a chance, you can go to Amtrak.com and you can buy train tickets. And it doesn't go all year round or anything. So I think there's only like three weeks left in it. But, and then again, I want to shout out CollarRail.org. C O L O R A I L dot org. And you don't have to ski to take the train. Just sure. to be really clear, there were people on the ski train that just wanted the experience of riding the train. And you don't have to do round trip in the same day. So you can buy your ticket, you can load your luggage. So not just your ski stuff, your luggage. You get into a different car and you can literally ride the train up, stay for the weekend, and ride the train home. All right. Last last thing on the train, uh, unless anybody has something to add. Everyone here, sound off. What is your biggest pro? Was it worth it? Would you do it again? Uh, Mel, real quick, do you have your biggest pro? Was it worth it? Would you do it again? Okay, my biggest pro was I'm usually the driver, so it was super fun to get to sit and look at the scenery and you know talk with everybody without having to be the driver and worry about traffic. I would absolutely do it again. What was the other thing? Was it worth it? Oh, it's totally worth it. I uh, Everything about it was fun. Uh, and I ate so much junk food on the way there that it was, um, I, had, I had to earn my turns. Awesome. Ryan Kelly. Uh, pro was the comfort. It was just comfortable. Um, the seats were comfy. There was enough room to put your ski boots on, um, get dressed, leave your stuff. The, the comfort and ease of it all. And I would 100% do it again. The only con I do have is it was really warm inside the train car on the way up. Like, don't uh, yeah. show up in your ski pants. Fair, fair point. Don't show up in your warm. ski pants and your jacket. Come, you know, just wear normal people clothes because you'll get the change when the when you get to the Moffat Tunnel. But um, that would not change my decision at all. Awesome. Dave? Yeah, the, the experience overall, I, your whole life you hear about the ski train. It's one of the how to ski. It's 100 things to do before you die. And it, it's way worth it. And absolutely not will I do it again. I'm going to do it again. But I'm not going to do it on a Friday. Winter Park yeah. is busy on a Friday. Like Friday's the new Saturday. Agreed. So I'm going to do it on like a Tuesday. 
I think uh, I'll have to double check this. I think it only runs Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Yeah, you're right. So, <laughs> damn it, <laughs> Dylan. Man, all right, Dylan. Uh, biggest pro was it worth it? Would you do it again? Uh, I have to add some weight into the comfort uh, lane because that's that's it. I mean, for me, I'm usually driving, like Mel said, and uh, it's almost eerily quiet in a very relaxing way. It's very smooth. You don't really feel a lot of bumps. You don't really have to worry about, you know, motion sickness. So just getting to take your boots off and like in a comfy padded chair that is going to take you back to Denver is huge. Uh, and yeah, the, <clears throat> again, I have to give kudos to the volunteers for making it, you know, a fun experience from top to bottom. Uh, even though I will say it's worth it hundred percent. If I had to have a con, it's just the mental struggle I had that I live in Arvada and I saw my house from the train <laughs> and I just had to go past it and go to Denver. <laughs> but, uh, st- that doesn't, that doesn't take away the fact that it's a hundred percent worth it. Every dollar, every extra minute, you're not driving through traffic. Uh, 10 out of 10 would do again. Nice. Yeah. The, the early morning, here's the thing. The early morning for me was a con until I got there and then it was like, I don't care. This is awesome. Yeah. So the, my pro was was definitely getting to ride there, honestly, with you guys, hang out, have fun. We're all in the same um, mode of transportation together. We're all hanging out. No one's having to drive. We're all just having fun. Totally worth it. Worth every penny. Worth waking up early. Worth coming back after dark and driving back home. And I would 100% do it again. Yeah. Awesome. So two subjects we didn't talk about. We're going to wrap it up, but next time uh, it's time for the skier safety act in Colorado to change. And, um, and I'll just, so you can ponder about it. It was written to protect ski area owners when they were mom and pops and protected them from liability almost unconditionally and was very important towards the success of skiing. But now that it's owned by, big corporations. It's not that they don't need protection and people need to take some responsibility because I'm a big fan of that, but it's time for it to change and our legislatures need to look into it. And that's going to be a big political talk because Altera just bought a basin. Yeah. yeah. And all right. I personally am not worried about it. I don't think same Altera is going to ruin a basin. They didn't ruin the other ski areas, but I do think it's the end of an era and if all the scaries in the state are owned by two companies, maybe it's not two now, but it's going to be there. Um, do they need legal protection at making record profits? Do they, do they still need those two things together? We'd love to hear what you think. And if you want to join us and talk about it, we'd love to have you on the show. Yeah. So you can reach out to us at how to ski it at bcclive.com. Or even better, go to the new howtoskiit.com. Join us on our forums. We are posting stuff there. We want to hear from you. We want to hear what you have to say. And as always, follow us on all our socials, Facebook, Instagram, threads, TikTok, and YouTube, all at How to Ski It. And that will do it for this time. Until next time, when we're talking about Altera's acquisition of A Basin and the change to the skier's responsibility code. Safety out. No, wait, nope. sorry. Say what? The uh, skier's responsibility code is a very different thing. That's like downhill skier has the right of way, stuff like that. The Skier Safety Act is legislation gracious. in Colorado that means. And, <laughs> We'll save it for the next wait, one. We'll teach Marcus. Okay, wait, no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> cut. I need to get an oil change. The, Can ski, you hit, the, hit the outro? safety act. Yes, Skier if you get run over act. by a snowmobile, oh, of a drunken see, employee. Now. If it's not considered gross negligence, which in the past that hasn't been, it's on your dime. Got it. Cutting all that out. The acquisition of better not cut by, that out. That is better not to God. I'll tear in the skiers. Safety Act. Next time, <laughs> how to ski it for Dylan, Ryan, Dave, Mel. I'm Marcus. We'll see you next time. I'm going to get my oil changed. I'm going to drive up by 70 tomorrow. That was awesome.